I'm going to have you turn to Job chapter 19. If you have a Bible with you, you can turn to Job. Don's been leading our Sunday school class through a study of Job for quite a while now, and it's been kind of freshly inspiring to me, the things that I've been able to hear and interacting with some of you about the content of Job. It's been just encouraging, and and I thought about a, a particular section of Job here in chapter 19 that really points to the resurrection of Jesus, and it it hit me in a really deep way, and I hope this is encouraging to you, and it will help us to appreciate the hope that we have because of what Christ did for us and because of him being raised from the dead thousands of years ago and how that gives us hope today and and kind of prepare our, our hearts and our minds for that. I just want to say, and, and probably you've noticed this, there, there's an obvious cultural tone right now, and it's been this way since the pandemic began a little over a year ago. Uh, and, and to me, maybe this may be a little bit of an oversimplification, but it seems like a little bit of a shift in emphasis, whereas before 2020, there, there was kind of an American cultural norm of ignoring mortality, trying to avoid the topic of death, and just everyone was busy about their lives and their goals and material things and so on and so forth. But we shifted from maybe an extreme in that regard to now this extreme, what I would call like a preoccupation with death, kind of a morbid preoccupation. And I'm guessing you've noticed it. If I were to talk with you, you, you would probably tell me that your experience like mine is that since 2020, there's probably been more thinking of death. I would guess that would be true of, of all of you. And if I were to talk to you, you, you would tell me whether it's something um, related to a direct kind of relationship that's been affected by death. You lost a loved one or you know someone who lost a loved one through COVID or something else or, or indirectly if you've just been paying attention to the news and the constant refrain of the media which is putting before us always the, the threat of death, the threat of this illness and, and it seems like almost exclusively the threat of this illness. Uh, and, and we had the, the death count that was displayed before us for a long time. And so there, there's been this preoccupation with death. I mean, do you, do you sense that? You, you can, you know what I mean, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious. And, and, and as I said, um, it, it, it helps us appreciate our need for, for hope, our need for the truth of the resurrection. And there's actually something to be gained, there's, there, there can be a, re, a de redemptive aspect of thinking about our, our death, our mortality. We're so often distracted and, and so often deluded or deceived where we don't, we, don't, we don't realize just how fragile we are and how fragile our loved ones are. We take things for granted. That's true. So, so there is something good about being confronted with, having to reckon with, with death. And, and, and the book of Job Probably most of you, if not all of you, know something about this book. And it really, uh, Job experienced a, a profound struggle with the concept of death. And so we're going to be in the section in chapter 19, but just to set it up, let me remind you of, of the story briefly here. Job, who was known as a, a righteous man, an upright man, a respected man in his community, uh, he had everything changed pretty drastically for him in a matter of like a day. Everything changed drastically, and and he went from having all sorts of material things, and he had oxen and sheep and camels and property and children, seven sons and three daughters, and all these signs of affluence, all these signs of God's blessing in his life that were obvious to him and to everyone around him, and frankly, he was enjoying those blessings until all of a sudden it came to a screeching halt when one day... Messengers came to him over and over and like like waves hitting hitting the beach over and over. He just kept getting more and more bad news. He was told about the Sabaeans had come in and they had stolen some of his, his animals and they had killed some of his servants. And then another messenger comes along and says, the Chaldeans have come and, and they, they killed some of his sheep and then they killed his servants. And, and, and that was bad. That was really bad. I mean, that was a costly loss. And then not long after that, he was informed that all 10 of his children were killed. I mean, you talk about a radical change and you talk about loss and grief and terror, horror. I mean, that's what he was experiencing. 
And as I said earlier, we've been thinking about death. I'm sure you have. I have. Maybe you've been touched by death, something close, or, or just your own fear of your own mortality, whatever it is. I mean, I, yeah, it, it, there's nothing harder. There's nothing harder than, than death. There's nothing we struggle with more. And certainly, Job did. And, and we're going to look at this chapter here where we, we get a glimpse into his heart. And, and we're going to actually see here, which will help us to appreciate First of all, what faith even is? I mean, you're here this morning, I'm guessing, because you have faith. You believe in an unseen God and some truths that you've heard regarding God that you're not experiencing with your natural senses, but you believe in. But this will help us appreciate even, I think, maybe a little more deeply what faith even is. And it will help us appreciate the resurrection hope we have because of what Christ did for us. So so, so Job 19 And we'll just somewhat quickly walk through this. If you know the story, not only did Job experience all those dreadful things, but he had these these friends, and we'll we'll go ahead and call them friends, even though uh, they probably weren't the best friends. You know, the expression with friends like these, who needs enemies? I think this is where it came from, because up to this point, Job's friends... While in the beginning they were quiet and they just sat with him in the ashes and they grieved with him, it didn't take long before they started opening up their mouths and giving him their two cents. And and a lot of it was just, frankly, unhelpful. And at the end of chapter 18, one of his friends basically says, Hey, Job, God doesn't do these things to good people. There has to be some wickedness in your life and God must be against you in some way. And so you better, better get your act together or figure this thing out lest more things happen to you. So again, not the most helpful, and probably we've all had some friends kind of like that, and we've all been that person at times. Job 19, then Job responded, how long will you torment me and crush me with your words? These 10 times you have insulted me, you are not ashamed to wrong me. Even if I have truly erred, my error lodges with me. If indeed you vaunt yourselves against me and prove my disgrace to me, know then that God has wronged me and has closed his net around me. I mean, for starters, he's he's basically saying to this friend and to his other friends, really, guys? You're going to kick me while I'm down? You're going to add insult to injury here? Hey, thanks a lot. And then notice what he reveals about his belief, what he deep down believes. It begins in verse 6, Know then that, that God has wronged me and has closed his net around me. As Don's been teaching through this book in Sunday school, we've been seeing this over and over, that while Job superficially was a righteous man and he kept the law and he was a good man, a good reputation on the outside. And there was a sense in which that was true of him in terms of his integrity. But underneath it, what we're seeing when when everything was stripped away, when he lost his stuff and his kids and not at all, by the way, making light of that, when he lost that, he, he responded in the same way any of us would. Not only with protest and anger toward his friends, but with protest and anger toward toward God himself. And he says, hey, God has wronged me. He's closed his net around me. He's trapped me. Look at verse 7 and following. Behold, I cry violence, but I get no answer. I shout for help, but there's no justice. He's walled up my way so that I cannot pass. He has put darkness on my paths. He has stripped my honor from me and removed the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. He has uprooted my hope like a tree. He has also kindled his anger against me and considered me as his enemy. His troops come together and build up their way against me and camp around my tent. He has removed my brothers far from me and my acquaintances are completely estranged from me. I mean, do you see what's coming out of Job here? This supposedly godly man, when he's really tested, when he's really pressed, when he loses everything, 
when he's stripped down, what is left but his, his own mortality and his own rebellion and his own anger with his maker. And he says, God, what you've done this to me. I thought we had a good thing going here. I'm the righteous guy and you reward me. That's the way this game works. What's, what's the deal with this? You're against me. Your, your anger, your elsewhere, he says, your arrows are penetrating me. We are all, as mere mortals, we are all just one phone call, one text message, one doctor visit, one news item away from sheer terror, death. And we've got to reckon with it. We, it's actually beneficial to accept it. And the fragility and the limitations. That those realities make us think about. And, and, and if, like Job, we were stripped of, if that happened, if we got the bad news or, or things just, things just got really, really, really dark and really, really bad, we too, like Job, would be showing our true colors. We'd be saying, God, what have you done? Why? It's amazing the little things that happened. Uh, Jill and I were talking recently, for whatever reason, in this season of our lives, w with some relationships we've had, particularly with some family members, have just been things that have happened that have been difficult. And it's like wave after wave after wave just coming in. And, and it doesn't take much to where you start just questioning the way this game is supposed to work. <laughs> what, what is happening here? In this normal human conditional thinking of why I thought we were doing our part and why are things unraveling and why, and you probably have felt that way too. And if you haven't, at some point you will. And, the, and it, when it comes to appreciating the good news of Jesus and what he did for us, the beginning of receptivity when it comes to that good news and appreciating resurrection hope is reckoning with death and physical death, yes, mortality, yes, but more importantly, spiritual death, which is that uprising of the heart, which says, God, no, it can't be this way. It must be the way that I design it. It must be according to my narrative. It must be according to my storyline. Otherwise, I can't handle it. I can't accept it. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. I like the giving part. Not so crazy about the taking away part. In our humanity, we are all preoccupied with the stuff. This is normal, natural. And those are good gifts of God. But, the, but this real threat, the real danger is that part of our hearts that's down there deep, dark like Job's where in the right circumstances, it can be shown that we too, by our nature, left to ourselves, would only be at war with our maker because we just want our way. So, so soak in that for a moment. And you accept that for a moment as true of you and true of me. No matter how well we clean ourselves up on the outside and our, our religiosity and All those good disciplines in our lives, but I mean, beneath those things, when we're confronted with our mortality, we're, we're just like Job. We're just like him. It says, uh, verse 14, my, my relatives even have failed. My intimate friends have forgotten me. Those who live in my house and my maids consider me a stranger. I'm a foreigner in their sight. I call my servant, but he doesn't answer. I have to implore him with my mouth. My breath is offensive to my wife. Husbands, you can relate to that probably in some ways. 
I am loathsome to my brothers, my own brothers. Even young children despise me. I rise up and they speak against me. All my associates abhor me and those I love have turned against me. My bone clings to my skin and my flesh and I have escaped only by the skin of my teeth. Pity me, pity me, O oh you my friends. I mean, at this point, he's kind of begging them. For the hand of God has struck me. Why do you persecute me as God does? And are not satisfied with my flesh. I mean, somebody give me a break here, is what he's saying. Without the raise of hands. Have you ever felt that way? I mean, is this ever going to let up? Somebody give me a break. And then there's this amazing, this section is one of the most amazing sections of the entire Bible. And I don't think that's an overstatement. Look what he says next. Because he has pour, he's pouring out his own struggle, his own anger, his own frustration. And then he says, oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Uh, by the way, they actually have been. <laughs> Lest he thought what he was going through was meaningless and somehow not of lasting value. And God's plan, it absolutely was. And he says that with an iron stylus and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. As for me, here it is, listen to this. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. And at the last, He will take His stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see and not another. My heart faints within me. I mean, this is truly amazing. This is an expression of, of faith, but faith in a way that we don't often think of. We often think of it in terms of this kind of honorable strength that we have. There's a section we looked at even this morning where Job's friends are talking about Job's kind of confidence in his integrity and his confidence in his fear, his own reverence. The emphasis is kind of on his faith, his reverence, his integrity. That's what we naturally understand. That's how we think of faith. I saw an article just yesterday where there's a celebrity talking about her faith. And she said, I, I would have crumbled except for my faith. What this passage reveals to us is this amazing truth that faith is actually seen more clearly after you've crumbled. Because it's after you've crumbled. It's when the worst has come out of you. It's when the, the darkness of human depravity and sin and rebellion and ingratitude and resentment and all that stuff comes out of you. And in response to that, what you hear back from God is, I forgive you. Because I live, you will live also. And you will live forever. In a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, and all things will be whole, and all things will be complete. This is what faith is. Faith is when I say, there's no reason that God should be loyal to me when He's the one who gave me everything I had in the first place. And I'm rip-roaring mad because he's taking it away. When fundamentally I'm revealing that I don't, and this is, I mean, can we just be honest about it? Fundamentally, I mean, do we really, even us, the best of us Christians, and I got several theological degrees, so I'm probably a better Christian than you. <laughs> we really excited about and content with just the fact that we're known and loved by God apart from the stuff, or are we just kind of into the stuff? Like the arrangement we've got going here when things are going well, right? But what God lovingly does in our lives, and even what he's doing, even culturally what's happening, which has been hard for all of us, for one degree or another, to one degree or another, wherever you stand on those issues doesn't even matter. It's been hard for all of us. And death is just in our face constantly. Uh, 
Jill was on a, a Zoom call with some people at the school the other day, and, and this is where you hear it, okay? Listen for this, because she was telling me about it and said, in this short Zoom call, they're talking about some intramural sports at the school and some other extracurricular activities. They, were, they used the word safety like a hundred times. Just listen for the word safety and, and forget about, I'm not even talking about what, how appropriate it is. Just listen for the word because what it's telling you is there's this underlying feel like we're trying to keep everybody alive here. And what that tells you is we're all terrified of the opposite of alive. And Jesus said, he who desires to save his soul will lose it. And who frantically does everything he can to control and protect and keep his life going, you lost it. It's gone. You don't have life because you're consumed with fear. He says, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And so he says to us, to that, that deep part of us which is in me and it's in you it's just that that discontentment just cannot accept mortality cannot accept loss cannot accept that when god if he brings it to my doorstep i'm going to be ticked off that part of me can i just hear god say hey i'm right there with you job i'm sitting in the ashes with you jeff fill in your name here i'm sitting in the ashes with you i know what you're sensing i know what you're feeling i know your fear i sympathize with every human weakness and i want you to hear this news it is finished the sacrifice has been made death has been taken yes your body will expire but your soul never will hear that you're forgiven you're loved you you will as surely as jesus was raised from the dead you will be raised from the dead and Ready for this? I, I, this is helpful to me because I'm kind of a neurotic guy and my feelings change a lot. I don't know about you. But he says, whether you feel that or not, that is true because God himself says it's true. It's capital T, true. It's objective, true. Thank God that's true, right? And Job, in the middle of this mayhem, there's this moment of clarity in which he says, wait a minute. I don't know, I don't know how, I don't know why, but this the, I have a redeemer, this kinsman redeemer, he's gonna be somewhat like me, and, and he's gonna cause me to somehow see God someday. And even if the worst happens and my flesh is taken and I die, I'm still gonna see God. And that's how we understand what faith even is. And then I feel like it's appropriate to finish this last part of the chapter. For one thing, I think it's funny. Verse 28, if you say, how shall we persecute him? And what pretext for a case against him can we find? He's speaking about his friends again. Verse 29, then be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword so that you may know there is judgment. Which, if you didn't catch it, his way of saying, hey guys, uh, it's probably coming for you too. So I hope you've enjoyed your opportunities to just give me your two cents. Just a heads up, it's probably coming for you too. And that is the human plight, right? That's what we're left to. That's what we're stuck with. If it were just up to us. When stripped down to nothing, and by the way, nothing is coming for all of us at some point, and what we have left is only our mortality and its fragility, and what is apart from God's grace, what is apart from God's spirit, only a rebellious, resentful heart, at that level, through Christ, and what he did for us, God speaks to this, this issue of just forgiveness, mercy, grace, covering. I came up again this morning, and if you haven't been part of the Job studies, you can find them on, online on the YouTube channel as well. But really great stuff that we've been, that Don and I have talked about for years now and came up again this morning, this idea that 
You, you, you see Job, I mean, people make much of, well, it says early on, Job didn't sin with his lips. But then you look, at the, I think it's the beginning of chapter 3, it says Job opened his, he opened his lips at some point, and he started protesting. And we see chapters and chapters of it. And then, and we'll end with this, you think of Jesus, who is the, the kinsman redeemer, the, the greater Job, the, 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 the man that all men and women ought to be but are not, the righteous one, Jesus. And at the worst, when, when Job lost everything with the exception of his own life, his rebellion came out, his anger came out. Jesus lost everything, including his life. And like a sheep before its shears, he went silently and willingly and compliantly, faithfully, lovingly, and sacrificially. And Jesus was Job's hope. Told the few details that he had. Christ was Job's hope. Christ is our hope. And he does say to us, because I live, you will live also. And that is an awesome, awesome hope. And I, and I pray um, that God helps us to believe that and to uh, hunt for eggs with our kids, go for a walk, enjoy a basketball game. <laughs> it's an amazing game last night, in case you hadn't heard. Freedom to live. Because the God who created life and sustains life says, I've got you covered. No matter what, even if the worst happens, still covered. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And that is true because God says it's true. All right, let's close in prayer and then we'll, we'll sing one last song. God, thank you for this message from Job 19 and recording this for us and letting us Look into the heart of another human being, a man who is, who is just like us, and in some ways better than us in, in his integrity and righteousness and uprightness on the surface and his conduct. But deep down, same heart that struggles with mortality and loss. God, we confess to you this morning that we do. That's, that's what plagues us with so much of our fear and frustration and jealousy and greed and everything else that controls us. It's all related to that same root of pride. And so we confess that to you this morning and we thank you for the provision of Jesus. We thank you that he came, that he lived, that he died, and that you rose him from the dead. so that we could know that our salvation has been secured, that we've been forgiven for all of our rebellion and resentment and ingratitude, that we've been forgiven, and that we have a hope that is as certain as you are, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. We thank you for these truths, and we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for what this Sunday represents. In Jesus' name, amen.